test, test. Ready? Good morning. I don't know if I'm heard or not. Good morning, Redeemer. There we go. <laughs> Good to see you all. Lot happening. It's, I think, are you happy because it, the weather has finally turned? Is that what's going on? <laughs> okay, good to have you here. Welcome. Any guests, a special welcome. And in fact, special welcome to a special guest, Dr. Don and Verne, Verne Byerly. And I'm going to introduce them more formally a little bit later in the service, but I'm excited about what we have uh, in store for us this morning. So I'm glad you're here. And when you get home and you tell your neighbor what they missed, because I can already say that because I'm that confident. But anyway, we'll, more about that later. I do have very quickly uh, a couple of announcements. One is a reminder that on Wednesday this week at the Performing Arts Center up at the school uh, is at 7 p.m. the baccalaureate service for our seniors in the community. And I just want to encourage you if you have a chance, really support them. Our, our, I mean, not many towns these days are doing this kind of a uh, faith event at graduation. Most of them have kind of pushed that aside. We still do it here. And I've told our students on that committee leading that how, how thankful and proud of them I am. And if our community continues to support them and give that message, I think it will bolster them. So 7 o'clock Wednesday night, if you can be there, uh, it would be a great thing for you to encourage them. Um, next week we're doing senior recognition and you know what we had uh, some little bit of miscommunication and that's on my part. Um, this is for seniors graduating this year but somebody said and, and this was where the miscommunication came in we should do a senior as in senior citizen recognition. That would be a big event here by the way. Um, but that's not what next Sunday is, but we will do that sometime, okay? <laughs> We're going to honor those seniors too, but not next week. Uh, no, remember that our worship schedule changes, what's today, the 7th? In three weeks, on Memorial Weekend, we go to a 9.30 worship service. So keep that in mind, mark your calendars. Uh, any other announcements? I, I'm going to let you know right up, front, uh, we're trying to give as much time as possible because we want to make the best use of, our, of Dr. Byerly here. So parts of the service have been curtailed in some ways uh, for that reason. He's going to be using his own scriptures in his presentation so we won't have readings. In our prayer time, I don't want to skip that, but I, I want to keep it to urgencies at this point, and, and uh, I just want to give him as much time as possible. So um, we'll cover that when we get to that point. Anything else need to be mentioned? If not, would you join me in prayer? Father God, we worship you this morning. We welcome you in this place. Holy Spirit, come and fill this sanctuary, and more importantly, Lord, just fill your people with joy and peace and, and uh, all that being in your presence brings us. And Lord, as we worship you this morning, do a work in us, in our hearts, in our spirits, in our minds, and open us and prepare us and point us in the direction for all that you have in mind for this church and this community. Use Dr. Byerly today, Lord, toward that purpose. And Lord, now receive our worship in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you stand with as we sing for the beauty of the earth? We can feel this one a little more right now. The, the, the earth the Lord made is beautiful always, but right now, oh boy.
7, 17. I will give thanks to the Lord because of his righteousness, and I will sing praise to the name of the Lord Most High. attention to what you were singing a few minutes ago you sang everyone needs forgiveness I hope you meant yourself too because we all need it so I'm going to invite you to receive it because it's free as we confess the words we'll use this morning corporately are printed in your bulletin Almighty God you are king of everything you are Lord of our lives you control the stars in heavens, and you humbled yourself to be a servant to us. In response to this, we continue to live as if we were kings and queens in our own lives, choosing to command our own destinies. Please show us your mercy and forgive our sins. And the Lord declares in Psalm 145 that he is faithful 
in all his words and kind in all his works. The Lord upholds all who are falling and raises up all who are bowed down. Amen. As I mentioned, we're going to abbreviate this a little bit. I do have uh, a short list that we do need to cover. I want to pray for Faith Search Ministries. Uh, just heard word this morning. Who told me about this situation in India? Who was that? Myrene. They were at a banquet, and was it the banquet speaker received word that a, a friend in India doing ministry work just texted an emergency saying they've just burned down 25 churches, six are dead so far, so that persecution continues to spread in that land. Then also, uh, huge thanks for your prayers. Um, Carol has been reminding us regularly to pray for her grandson Josh Newman with multiple sclerosis. Funding had been declined, and they just learned that they had made, they got in touch with a Christian nurse, and she said, it looks like there's a mistake here in what was recorded for your, for your uh, uh, income. And they looked at it, and now the MS Society is covering 100%. So another answer to prayer. So uh, Also, we've been praying, oh, for good two, three years for Heather Zins, and she's had ups and downs, her and her husband Israel, just learned that her brain tumor is growing again, and it's just a tough time, so we're going to keep Heather in our prayers. Any other urgent situations for which we need to pray, Linda? What's her name, Linda? Eileen? Linda's oldest sister is in serious condition with heart and lung issues. Uh, in, is she hospitalized right now? St. Cloud. Okay. There was another hand. Carol. Mike Hoffman, still in intensive care. He's a community guy that's been here forever. Um, needs dialysis currently. They're hoping that it's not permanent, so pray for that. Kurt. I think it's urgent that we wish you a happy birthday to the Greeks. That's not urgent. <laughs> I'm the one standing here. I'm just going to tell you we're not praying about that today. <laughs> But thank you. <laughs> yes, Brad. Uh, our friend Brian Alden. Yeah. He just died. He complained to Oregon. Specifically, he was lying to the Metropolitan Family Prayers for healing and answers to it. Do they know? They don't know what's going on for sure yet. Many of you know Brian and Lisa Alden. Brian in intensive care with inflamed lungs. He's on a ventilator, um, looking for answers. So and for healing. Okay, let's pray together. Lord, we are reminded, and it's so important to remember that there is nothing which is impossible for you. We also are mindful, God, that all things are in your hands and your purposes are as high and far beyond and above ours as the heavens are above the earth. And yet one more reminder, Lord, you say, ask and it will be given. You say you have not because you ask not. So, Lord, we come in the name of Jesus asking you to intervene in these situations. Lord, we lift up a land and people living there or ministering there far on the other side of the world in the nation of India. And Lord, people who love you and are representing you are being persecuted, even killed. Their places of worship are being burned down. 
Lord, we ask you for protection. We ask, God, that in any situation where this is happening, that testimony of Jesus and the power of God would be poured out in such a way that your kingdom would expand further because it happened. Comfort those who are mourning. And, and Lord, in every step, give them the assurance of your presence and your protection. Father, we praise you today, and you heard the thanksgiving for answering the prayers on behalf of Josh Newman and providing his funding for his medic so, such needed medication. God, continue to bless and pour out further blessing upon this young man and upon his situation. In Jesus' name. Lord, we lift up this young mother, Heather Zins, been battling brain cancer. And you've given her these months and years, and God, we ask for more. This latest growing season of this cancer, we ask, God, that you would speak to those cells and say, go no further. We commend her into your keeping, into your love and grace and purpose. Lord, bless her, her husband, her children. Give them hope and joy and confidence in Jesus. Father, we lift up Linda Montgomery's sister Eileen in a serious heart and lung situation up in St. Cloud. And Lord, you know why and all the details, but we just commit them into your keeping and ask God that you would intervene and use these circumstances to show your power and your grace and your love for her. God, we ask for healing. We pray for Mike Hoffman. Thank you, Lord, for the improvements that have been noted, but yet a still, still a serious situation. God, continue to move that situation forward and continue, Lord, to uh, stay before him in such a way that his eyes are on you and his hope is in you, his life is in you. We ask here, too, God, for healing in Jesus' name. And once again, Lord, for healing, we ask on behalf of Brian Alden, went into intensive care with in, inflamed lungs. He's on a ventilator. And Lord, answers are not readily available, but you know them. And Lord, whatever the cause, whatever is going on here, we give that into your hands in Jesus' name and ask that you would show your presence and power to heal and to bring forth your purpose through trials. Then, Lord, we lift up Don and Verne Byerly and ask, God, that you would use them in our midst today powerfully, that you would move our hearts, our spirits in such a way to, to recognize that you are doing something, and this is part of it, and you're calling us to respond to what you're doing. So, Holy Spirit, may your purpose through this ministry, through this man, be furthered in our lives, in, in our community. All these things we ask and pray in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. As we prepare to receive our offering, I'm just going to give these instructions. The, the offering plate will go by if you are giving an offer, your regular Redeemer offering, and you're writing a check, you'll do that as you do to Redeemer. Any cash that's in the plates will be Redeemer offering. If you're giving ca a cash offering to Faith Ministries, there's a basket in the aisle as you leave. If you're writing a check to Faith Search, you may put that in the offering plate and that'll get separated. And is that clear as mud? <laughs> so checks you can put in the offering, cash put in the basket for Faith Search. Okay? Everything else will go to Redeemer's offering. Um, and by the way, everything you give to Faith Search goes to the ministry 100%. So, thank you for that. Uh, uh, do we have ushers at this time to come forward? This 
song we're going to sing is a David Crowder song. It's called Red Letters. And basically it refers to the powerful, miraculous words of Jesus that he has in the Bible. Dr. Byerly up, just want to uh, point this out in your bulletin, you have a response form, it says my response. Put these in the basket as you leave, anyone who would choose to use this, and I hope you all will. On the bottom it says I have questions about growing faith. This is growing faith. This is the study. We've already had a leadership team that has gone through it, and every one of them didn't want to stop. Uh, this is what we'll start with next fall in our small group ministries. 
if you are even thinking I might want to be a part of a small group, and I would love 100% of us to do that. I don't know if that's realistic. I'm praying it is. But would you put a check mark at next to that? I have questions about growing faith, and that's going to tell me you are thinking about being a member of a small group. We're going to sort all that out over the summer so we can kick it off in the fall, and Dr. Byerly will be back with us. Let me introduce who this man is. I think some of you found out his son lived here, uh, not while I was here, before I came back. But anyway, Dr. Don holds degrees, uh, MA and PhD degrees in life sciences and an MA degree in New Testament studies. As a research scientist, he was a team member on scientific expeditions to both Arctic and Antarctic polar regions, published several articles in scientific journals. As an educator and academic dean, he's been active for 35 years teaching biology, biblical studies, and worldview subjects in college classrooms. He's an author of several books and video series, has conducted training around the world in places such as the Marshall Islands, Amsterdam, the Philippines, and throughout India. Don has authored several books and video series, including the widely circulated Surprised by Faith. By the way, he has some copies back there. I've read it. If you haven't, get one. Uh, he un has an unusual ability to analyze technical, scientific, and theological subjects and communicate them in a clear, original, and fascinating way. A former academic dean and vice president for instruction, Dr. Byerly currently holds the position as president of Faith Search International in Edina, Minnesota. He and his wife, Verne, have two married sons and six grandchildren. Would you welcome Dr. Don Byerly? Appreciate a chance to come out here to, we, we live in Sioux Falls. Um, we used to be a part of Lincoln County, but then we moved and now we're in that other county. Uh, <laughs> just to get you maybe a little bit closer to us, my wife and I both grew up on farms out near Scotland, Parkston area. Um, and that was our growing up place. and. Uh, then uh, when I went to college, I went a couple of years to Augustana. Uh, didn't graduate, but uh, went somewhere else to graduate. Um, and uh, we, when, I, when I went beyond that to get additional education, I went to the university in Vermilion, picked up my master's and PhD. My first job was five years in the biology department at the University of Sioux Falls. We've been around a while, uh, different kinds of things. Of course, don't let that university stuff bother you. Uh, perhaps you've heard of the, uh, there once was a man named Nesser. He came to know Lesser and Lesser. Finally, one fall, he knew nothing at all, and they made him a college professor. Mm. <laughs> it's not all that it's cut out to be. <laughs> um, we have two sons. One, as Pastor Tom referred to, uh, Steve, uh, was... Uh, uh, a very much of a nature guy, and he did a lot of, uh, while he was around here, he planted trees. He ended up out in Yellowstone. But uh, about uh, eight years ago, uh, his family took a vacation out to uh, the Pacific in California, went to a rare beach, uh, a lot of rock uh, outcroppings. His middle son got careless, got out too far, got thrashed against the rock, broke his arm, thrashed his head and he was going to drown out there. So our son went out, Steve went out after him, and uh, was able to get to him, was able to bring him back to shore three times. The waves were so large that they kept sucking him back up as soon as they got close. So finally, the last time, I guess, he must have got some footing or something, and he just heaved his son over the breaker, got the son out, and he thrashed against rocks and lost his life. So uh, my youngest son then, the one that used to live just south here of Canton, and attended here uh, some, uh, is with the Lord in heaven. And, uh, and then our older son, Brad, is uh, in Sioux, just moved to Sioux Falls. Uh, I guess South Dakota has a magnet for our family. Uh, moved to Sioux Falls. He's, uh, we, when my wife and I are here, we're only here about six months out of the year. We go to Abiding Savior in Sioux Falls. And our son came here to be sort of the headmaster. Anybody here have kids in the school at Abiding Savior? Uh, he's the headmaster at the school at Abiding Save, you know. Uh, so uh, we're, we keep, we keep uh, navigating back to South Dakota. 
Um, I think that's enough. Pastor Tom's been trying to save some time, and I'm spending it. <laughs> uh, let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for the opportunity, the privilege to, um, to be here to proclaim your word. And it's our desire, Lord, that uh, it be uh, overseen by the Holy Spirit, that uh, each one would hear uh, the message as you uh, minister to them. And I pray that uh, it would be uh, not a one a message of negative, but a message that is positive that uh, we can rally behind. And that uh, we give you praise and thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm kind of a, a, a kind of a, a, a teacher uh, of sorts, and I will tend to be uh, back and forth and running around uh, uh, kind of a teaching sermon this morning. Uh, and you might wonder, what kind of a guy is this that says he wants to set the church back 2,000 years? Uh, that came from actually Billy Graham. Early in Billy Graham's crus uh, crusade history, he was out in Los Angeles. Uh, one of the earliest crusades he did, and it was uh, really powered by the Holy Spirit, and he was out there for weeks. But uh, one of the clergymen, in the uh, Los Angeles area, didn't like him, and uh, said to the press that this guy is setting the church back a hundred years. And when the press asked Billy Graham about it, he says, oh, if that's the case, I have failed. What I was hoping is we might set the church back 2,000 years. And of course, he's obviously referring to the first century church that we read about in the book of Acts. And uh, after Pentecost, keep in mind, what is the big celebration this month in church history formula? Well, the last Sunday of this month is Pentecost Sunday. And of course, that's 50 days after Passover. And during 40 of those, Jesus was still on earth. So the things I want to have you think about is, this is the month that Jesus was here on earth. And what if you had been there in the first century and you could still see him? You could still be with him. Of course, resurrected body as they were. Let me, let me just use a couple of uh, examples. One of the things that, of course, we're encouraged to do is remember his death. Well, it opened the way for forgiveness and reconciliation with God. And we have passages of Scripture that summarize that. Christ died for sins once for all. The righteous for the unrighteous. To bring us to God. But what if you were there in 30 A.D. and Jesus was still around? Wouldn't that be a little bit more poignant? Wouldn't you really wonder, whoa, this is real. We witnessed his death. I'm trying to point out to us that if it were really us back there, would you not be reacting a little differently? Would you not be maybe like the first century church 2,000 years ago, a little bit more, maybe on fire? Or this passage, God demonstrates his own love for us in this while we were still sinners. Christ died for us. For if when we are God's enemies... We were reconciled. How much more shall we be saved through his life? Well, what about this? That was less than two months previously for them. They saw his death. What if that were us? How would we be reacting today? Or this. What about the resurrection? Would you not have been pretty excited? Would I not have been terribly excited if suddenly we were, de we were desperate? He was gone. He had died. And all of a sudden, he's alive. That'd be pretty exciting, wouldn't you think? But is that still true today? Is that still fresh in our hearts and in our minds? You see, that's the difference between the church today and the church 2,000 years ago. It was fresh for them. May was the month he was still there. That was the time and then they saw him die. That's when they saw him as a resurrected Savior. And it's kind of faint 
in our heads, isn't it? It's a bit long ago. Scripture, there's therefore now no, and they would have experienced this, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Remember the law condemned us? Sin condemned us to an eternal death? For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. I'm trying to get us to the point where we realize, wait a minute, that was less than two months ago for those folks. For us, it's 2,000 years. Can we get it fresh again? And would that make a difference for the church here in Canton? I think so. One more. They were there when he ascended and went back to heaven. The end of Luke's gospel, they saw him being taken up into the clouds. I'd have liked to have been there. And what he said right before he left, you are witnesses of these things. All of his followers. Well, these things, what is he talking about? Well, death, repentance, forgiveness, resurrection, and eternity in heaven. That's what you're a witness of. That's what he told us. He didn't say you'll do witnessing. It said you are a witness. You realize we're 24-7, folks. You can't help being a witness. Like it or not, whether you want to or not, you are a witness. You can't hide. That was just a week ago for them at Pentecost. Eight days before Pentecost, they observed him ascending into heaven. That makes Pentecost pretty exciting. That makes May pretty exciting. Then he told them, though, you know, if you're going to really be that witness and, and so forth, you're probably going to need a helper. And so at that point, he also said, I, I have a helper, but stay in the city until you've been clothed with power from on high. And of course, we know that he's referring to the Holy Spirit. And he also knows that in eight days, it was going to be Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, when power comes from on high. And in the church today, and you see, the last thing I want this message to be is somehow I'm outside of it. No, no, I'm inside of it. I'm wondering myself, do I need a new Pentecost? Do I need a new revisiting of the Holy Spirit? Do we even understand that? Do we even know that? Because Jesus said, without the power from on high, what I'm asking you to do isn't going to happen. It's called, when John the Baptist introduced Jesus to, to the world at that, in that place, he said he's going to do two things. He's going to take away the sin of the world. And for that, we're deeply thankful. And he said, secondly, he's going to baptize with the Holy Spirit. John chapter 1. That's the two things he's going to do. In the church today, we have sort of liked this first one. <laughs> we like taking our sins away. The second one, we're not so sure what it even means. That he baptizes us with the Holy Spirit. There were 120 people in the upper room in Acts chapter 1. He said, you're going to be my witnesses. There were only 4 million Jews. That's 33,000 apiece. <laughs> no small, I mean, just a, no, no difficulty, no problem, right? But with the power from on high that day, 3,000 were saved in the first day. Could it happen today? Have we lost our optimism? Have we lost vision? Has God changed? Or have we? You see, the first century church, 
recognized that what Jesus had done, let me read just a little bit from that here, that they were a body for Christ. Why did you come this morning? Well, you worship. You pray for one another. Encourage one another. You have potluck dinners for fellowship. <laughs> Together, we are a body for Christ. And that was one of the intentions that God has for us, is that we find comfort, we find encouragement, we find uh, it's, it's just wonderful to be with people we know and love and who share common values with us. That's a body for Christ. And what does the Scripture say in the book of Acts? Acts 2.42, they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. We find a couple of verses later in chapter 2, and all those who believed were together and had all things in common. And in chapter 4, and the congregation of those who believed were of one heart and soul, for where there was not a needy person among them. That's the body for Christ. We like that. The church is not doing a bad job about that. Secondly, I'm trying to keep it simple, the church is a builder of saints. There was a tremendous amount. Remember, I just read they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching. But we will devote ourselves in chapter 6 to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. In chapter 16, so the churches were being strengthened in the faith. Acts 18, and Paul settled in Corinth a year and six months, teaching the Word of God among them. It's, it's absolutely critical that we understand that I don't just go to church. The church is to teach me Ephesians chapter 4. To become like my Savior and Lord little by little over time. That's why the Holy Spirit was put within us so that we might be able to take the Word of God and it transforms us and helps us to manifest the fruit of the Holy Spirit so that we become credible witnesses in the community. And the body is a wonderful place that people want to be a part of. Where else can you go that everybody is pulling for you? They're on your side. And you come and you have instruction and guidance. You continually grow in your understanding of your relationship with God. And we are therefore a builder of saints. Not holier than thou, but holy. And thirdly, the Bible says we are a bridge to the lost. For we, Peter and, and John said, we cannot stop speaking what we have seen and heard. In Acts 5, you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching. Acts 5, 42, and every day in the temple and from house to house, they kept right on teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. You are my witnesses. No, I didn't say, and I have another, I have a seminar that I'm going to try to maybe talk Pastor Tom and leadership group or whatever. Maybe sometime I could come out and share another seminar called Friend to Friend. Because the training to be witnesses, the training in evangelism in the history of the church has typically been Lone Ranger teaching. You do it solo. And because people are intimidated by that, five at most percent of the people in the church have grabbed a hold of teaching, training in the area of witnessing and evangelism. It's too intimidating. I don't want to lose all my friends. <laughs> friend to friend insists that Jesus' teaching said, you are my witnesses. It is the task of the church to reach its community. I did not say the pastor. <laughs> it is the task of the church, not you alone, to reach a community for Christ. And friend of friend shows 
how that can work so that you have 100% participation, not 5%. Of course, that depends on whether you even care or whether you even want to. And that's where the builder of saints comes in. That's why nurture in the church is so important. Unless we grow in our spiritual life and we become more and more like our Lord, we really don't care. Oh yes, we have a son or a daughter that's not saved. We care about them. A relative, a close friend. But the world... can't relate to that. But this is what they did. They were a body. They had all things in common. They they supported one another. They worshipped. They had instruction in the builder of saints. They were a bridge to the lost. So what did they do according to the early chapters of Acts? They did two things, and I won't have time this morning to go through chapter by chapter by chapter, but go through some time all the way through chapter 12 and look for how many times it says they met to pray. And then look at how many times it says they shared Jesus and witnessed. You see, they prayed and they told people about Jesus. Why? Paul wrote to the Ephesian church and he said, So I say this, and affirm in the Lord, that you are no longer to walk just as the Gentiles walk in the futility of their minds, being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of two reasons. One, they're uninformed, they're ignorant. Two, they reject the message that they've heard. They're hardened hearts. What do you do for people who are uninformed? You tell them. (laughs) You inform them of the good news. What do you do for people who are hard and you they reject you? Doesn't do any good to keep telling them over and over again. Pray for them. Turn the Holy Spirit on them in a kind way. But you have to care. It has to matter to us. But that's what you see, the first eight chapters of the book of Acts, praying, telling, praying, telling. What was the result? Well, Acts 1.15 says there was 120, and then we have another chapter or so later, there were 33,000. Then they added day by day, there are 5,000 households, then there were multitudes, and then increased greatly Ju- then went Judea, Samaria, Galilee, and then the entire Roman Empire. Do you realize that in the very first century, starting with 120 people, Christianity spread from the entire eastern to the western frontier of the entire Roman Empire, a distance of 3,500 miles? Power from on high. Could it happen today? Three thousand five hundred miles. Testimony of hundreds of thousands of the century following Pentecost was figured to be like the blind man that Jesus healed, whereas I was blind, and now I see. Hundreds of thousands. See, I don't want to give a message that creates guilt. But how do we go through the first century and look at the church 2,000 years ago and compare it to today? It seems to me that we need to go to our knees in prayer and say, Lord, what are we missing here? So it's impossible today, of course, to do what the first century did. What percentage of Americans attend church regularly in the United States? Well, I looked it up. They claim that they go at least two times, but many every week or more, 31%. 
How many people did they start with in the first century church? 120. We're starting with millions. A third of the people in the United States attend church regularly. What if you were to take and ask each one, or what if this was the case, take all the unchurched people and assign them to those who are churched? How many would each person have? Two. A third of us are already going to church and perhaps, I, I hope, at least saved, understand salvation is by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Two apiece. And we've got the whole country. That's impossible. You immediately will detect where I'm heading. Why isn't that happening then? Because most of the people in churches across the United States are going to sit in a pew and they're going home and that's the end of it for them. They intend nothing more. They have no desire to go beyond that. Now that's kind of condemning. And I, I, again, I, I came here not to be negative, but what will it take for us to realize that we have the horses God has given us millions and millions of people who are saved. But they're AWOL. They don't understand. They don't understand what Jesus said. Only if we were back there in May of 30 AD, I think we'd have gotten it clear. But 2,000 years later, we've forgotten it all. And it's not fresh anymore. It's what I, I experienced when I went to uh, 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 doing college work, uh, teaching. I was at St. Paul Bible College for about 20 years as academic dean and as a professor there. And uh, I, I, I could tell people were sending their young men and women to college, to Bible college there. And I could almost tell you after a semester of classes with the students, which ones were first generation and which ones were second generation third, fourth, fifth, sixth generation Christians. Those that had just come to faith in Christ and they wanted to come and they wanted to learn the Word of God and they were excited about it. Those that were second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth generation, they'd never known anything else but church. And they lacked the enthusiasm. They had no fire. We are those sixth 20th, 100th generation of Christians who have forgotten what it was like to be saved and therefore motivated to so go to talk to others who have not yet come to that place. What was Jesus' strategy? He said, go, and we read this in passage, and he said this in May, in 30 A.D., Go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, teaching them. And we say, oh yeah, there's a lot of commands that we have to do. No, he only gave one command. Make disciples. That's the only command in that passage. We are to make disciples. Not get a decision. Not get a baptism. Make disciples. And that means going like bridging to the lost. It means assimilating them into the body of Christ. And it means nurturing them. Why nurture? It's the only way you're going to get them to become active in making disciples. We stop after bridging and assimilating, and we say that's good enough. We lost the nurturing part that Jesus commanded. And only if we nurture will people turn around and become active in the task of making disciples. Pastor Tom would appreciate this. Two people want to start a church. So they decide to do what Jesus told them. They're going to bridge. They're going to assimilate. They're going to nurture. At the end of 10 years, they have now 64 people in their church. And their district superintendent sort of suggests to them, maybe you should think about another job. Not impressed. But the couple continue to do exactly what they did. That is, 
They bring people in, they nurture them, and so that they turn around and do exactly what the, the two original people do, so that everybody is participating, everybody is doing it. So they keep the church going for another 10 years, and now they have 2,000 people. Now they'd have the pastor of that church going all over the district, all over the state, all over the nation, telling him what his secret is. He's not doing anything different the second, second 10 years than he did the first 10 years. Bridging. Next. <laughs> Assimilating into the body of Christ and then nurturing them to do the same with other people. See, we, it, unless you do that, you have no multiplication. You're counting your church in terms of addition. Oh yeah, we added another family, two more. But we never stop and think, wait a minute, those two should become four in two years. Those four should become eight in another two years. That's why Jesus said, nurture them. In 30 years, the church would be 65,000, and in 40 years, 2 million. One pastor's lifetime of work. We don't believe Jesus. We're not doing his strategy. So the key is nurturing, and that's where I need to, I need to wrap this up. We're running a little long here. Why nurturing? There's a pastor mentioned the book Growing Faith, and he and some leaders have gone through it. It's not a miracle book, but it's a nurturing book. It's going to show you how to do spiritual warfare going to help you to be able to understand the Holy Spirit and lean on the Holy Spirit and it's going to help you know why church is absolutely essential for your life. All the foundational issues, I hope you've found that to be true anyway as you go through that and I'm going to be back in September and kick off and invite all of you to participate in nurturing. It's the key to multiplication. And people have sometimes a negative feeling. We don't, we're not here because we want to multiply the church. We don't have that kind of a motivation when to grow the church. Well, I hope I could change your mind. Not grow the church, but take the message to people so that they are saved. And once they're nurtured, by the way, assimilating them to bring, to, so for them to come to a place of profession of faith in Jesus Christ does not say they're going to be in the church. Only nurture, you take those folks, we need couples, we need women, we need men, we need youth who are trained in growing faith so that when someone comes to faith in Christ, they might meet down at the restaurant, they might meet in a home somewhere. The church that nurtures the new commitments are the church that's going to get them into their fellowship. You don't nurture them, they may never show up in a church. And so you nurture for weeks, and then they get to know Christians. And you bring people from the church into the study over a period of several weeks, they get to know you. You know where people go to church? Where their friends are. And nurturing builds friendship with new believers. And that's where we're headed. That's what we'd love to see happen. See, the heart of Jesus before he left in May of 30 AD, he told Peter, do you love me more than these? What was he referring to? Probably he held up a fish. <laughs> you love me more than these? Then if, if you do, then feed my sheep. Nurture them. Help them to grow. And then tell them, have them tell me, tell everybody about me everywhere. The two marching orders of Jesus in May 30 AD. Feed my sheep. Tell everybody about me. 
That doesn't make it very difficult, does it? Very easy. That's the task that we have. Where do you start? Well, 30,000 people were asked, what brought you to faith in Christ and the church? There's a pastor, there's Sunday school, there's a church program, and on and on and on. But over 80% of the people said a friend and a, or a family member. So what do you do? Friend to friend says, stay close to home. You don't need to go on the streets of Sioux Falls. If you can and you're gifted that way, it's good and it's right. But 99% of the people won't. And so what we're doing is saying, you're going to stay close to home. And you say, you don't know my relatives. <laughs> well, maybe I don't. But when 80 plus percent of the people come to faith in Christ and the church through friend, family and friends, every one of us have a network of influence, their co-workers, friends, relatives, neighbors, and so forth. And according to a, a national surveys, we have on average about eight unbelievers in our network of influence. That's your mission field. Don't worry about India. Yes, you can give to India. Yes, there are people who are called to India. I'm not saying it's wrong. For you, it is close to home. That's where you're going to be effective. Identify those people. And this is part of our friend-to-friend -friend training. Identify them. Make a list of three people, privately, confidentially, and then that's why it's intentional. And then you're going to pray for them every day. Why? Because it's spiritual warfare. The Bible is very clear on that. You need to have intercessory prayer. Satan wants to keep a hold of them for his kingdom. You're ripping them away from him and putting him in the kingdom of God. That's going to be a warfare. So you pray for them on a regular basis, but in order for this to happen, it's got to be intentional. And thirdly, you build relational bridges with people in the community. You already do it. It's already happening. Do it intentionally. Have burgers on the grill. Go to a movie. Whatever it takes, activities, service items, or whether it be, uh, you know, the the encouragement of some sort. Somebody has a birthday, somebody has an anniversary. Be a good neighbor. That's building relationships. And that, if you're a credible witness, that breaks down the barriers that people have between themselves and the church. And then, of course, there's more, but we will. If you do what I said, you identify, you pray, you build relationships, you create receptivity on the part of people. Then you have events and so forth, and somewhere along the line, they do decide they want to be a follower of Jesus. You still don't have them in the church. All you've done is got a commitment to Jesus Christ. Unless you nurture, they will not show up here. And that's why you need teams of people in the church who nurture everyone who is interested in learning more about the Word of God. Those are the people that are going to come up and show up here. That go to those classes. In other words, integration into the church is a product of nurture. I know this is a fast run through, but I mean, I'm going to even skip this. This is bridging. This is going through the, the assimilation, and then there's the, see right here is what we're not doing. Yeah, we have, Pastor Tom is preaching here every week, and you have a Sunday school. But we need to be preparing people for the fact that they would do this. Come down and become one of the witnesses who are bridging, who are assimilating, and are nurturing but they do it as a team. You do it as a total church, not as a solo person, not as a lone ranger. And that takes the intimidation away and allows you to function where you're gifted and also according to your maturity level. Nobody is expected to do the same thing as somebody else does. Everybody will do that within the context that they're comfortable with. 
And of course, when Jesus left, he said, the Son of Man has come to seek, or the scripture says in Luke 19, come to seek and to save that which was lost. But in the upper room, the night before he was crucified, what did he pray to the Father? As the Father has sent me, I also send you, he told his disciples. And that's the task. That's what he left us with. And he didn't prepare a backup. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Tough message. I prayed and prayed that it could make this positive and non negative, uh, affirming, not critical. But I have to rely on the Holy Spirit to make that happen. And I'd love to help if there's something I could do out working with Pastor Tom and, and so forth. But I'd, I'd love to see the joy of the church of 2,000 years ago. Lord, thank you for this time and privilege I have. I pray that uh, indeed you would use the truth of your word to set us on fire. And I pray, Lord, that not for performance, but out of a heart of love and a heart of joy give you thanks in Jesus name. Amen. You might ask back there at the table. We've got some really, really <laughs> deals uh, for, for you if uh, you want to ask about it. And I am starting after four and a half decades of ministry like this. I'm collecting all my messages, sermons, books, videos, all the kinds of stuff. And just this month, opened the Faith Search Bible Learning Center. You can go to faithsearchlearning.org. Faithsearchlearning.org. And by the, within two to three years, there'll be 30-some courses. And many messages and sermons, including the discovery that this book is based on, is on there right now. You can take the course right now. I have video instruction there. We have the book available for you. And uh, so I'm trying to do what Jesus told Peter, feed my sheep. And why die and have it all trashed? Why not collect it and put it available online free of charge? No cost to anybody, including the books. We send them to you free. And so if any of you are interested in that, my wife has a sign-up sheet where we make announcements of every time we put another course up on the Learning Center. And uh, you'll get an email to make that announcement. Thanks so much, Pastor. Just a reminder, if uh, use this, put the check mark down at the bottom by Growing Faith if you're interested in joining a small group. Church, we need to get excited about what we have. Because if we're not excited about it, we're not going to tell others. And our whole purpose for being here is that more people would be in heaven. We need to tell them. Acts 4.12 says there's salvation in no one else, for there's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Let's close as we sing, in Christ alone.
Black Paladino. Praise God.